Welcome everybody to BlizzCon. We know that you all want to hear more about Overwatch 2. Allow us to invite you behind the scenes to explain more of what we're doing and why. Everybody, please hit record. Fingers crossed. We lost Scott. <laughs> it's off to a good start. This is going great. We've been assembling one of the best teams that I have ever worked with. I'm nervous. <laughs> and I'm so proud of the progress that we have made together. We really liked the stylized drop down. Imagine that it's coming forward, boom, boom. This starts to spin. The scale and the scope of this game have meant that we've needed to grow substantially. Just have, we have to do this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me start over. Overall, I, I think we've done incredibly well as a team moving to work from home. <laughs> oh, shadow play. There have definitely been challenges, but the team is really putting everything we've got behind this game. To me, it's the next big step in the Overwatch universe. New heroes, game modes, major story beats. With competitive and PvE, I see Overwatch 2 as the Overwatch for all of my friends. You know, we're always inspired by what story and franchise development does with the animated shorts. We really wanted to bring that cinematic experience into the game. You can invest in your heroes and grow them over time. I am super geeked out about Overwatch 2. I can't wait for people to play this game. It just gets better and better. There are some things that we just can't do without a sequel. So thank you so much for your patience so far, and I hope you enjoy this behind the scenes look at Overwatch 2. All of our players at home, they wanna see one of the new maps that we've never talked about before. Really, I can just like, I can just talk about anything that I want to. Yes. You're, you're you're serving this up to the guy that is like unintentionally leaked information in past <laughs> interviews. <laughs> you can do it officially now. Okay. So one of the maps that I'm I'm most excited for in Overwatch 2 is our Rome map. We always want Overwatch to feel like this globe-trotting adventure for our players. So we're having a lot of fun coming up with the Overwatch version of Rome. We wanted a very romantic, sort of this powerful feeling of old world architecture. One of the most exciting things for me is the early building of these maps, where we get to sit down together with key people from the environment team, level designers, effects groups. We'll spend some time talking about moments in the game that we really want to see like the Colosseum or a grand view of the hills of Rome in the backdrop. And then we'll go back and do a paint over or we'll do a concept painting of certain things based on that. We try to draw inspiration from as many different sources as possible. For example, one of our environment artists had just taken a trip to Rome and he returned with thousands of pictures and was so excited um, to work on a map set in Italy there's a lot of ancient architecture in Rome that represents the, the empire that it used to be. So we brought some of that back. Some of the things that are destroyed in real life, we kind of rebuilt in a kind of an Overwatch style. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of environment art that I think we've made for the entire game and it just absolutely took my breath away. Can we reveal more maps? Yes, Scott. <laughs> Scott, why don't you have the honor? Why don't you reveal, yes. like, is there an artified, like, let's pick an artified I, I one. Know, I know what map I want to talk about. It's the one that I just get super excited about. New York City. New York City is just an amazing Overwatch location. We're really striving to make it as authentic as possible while still putting this Overwatch spin on it. There's a lot of amazing buildings and architecture pieces that just, especially for artists, stands out a lot. And they usually use this kind of art deco style from the 1920s, 1950s. We started in an area that's a little bit like the village. There's some smaller shops there. There's a fire station, little pizza places and things that people that are familiar with New York City will either recognize or maybe see the reference that we're trying to make with some of our different locations. It feels like something you haven't seen in other games before because it's uniquely Overwatch. 
Well, we should move on. Otherwise, we just have to reveal more <laughs> maps. So we were talking about PvP. And, you know, one thing that I think is really interesting about PvP in Overwatch 2 is some of the philosophical changes we're making to the approach. PvP feels different and new. We're up grading our combat feel. The roles are playing differently. When it comes to all new maps, it's a pretty big departure uh, from where we are on live right now. So uh, I, I can't wait to see where we end up with it by the time we launch this thing. We're also experimenting with the idea we call role passives, which are passive abilities that a hero can have based on what role they are. For example, currently in our internal builds, uh, the tank heroes all have knockback reduction against them, and they also generate less ultimate charge for enemies that are shooting at them. Damage dealing heroes have a movement speed bonus, which is great for flanking around the map. And uh, healing heroes, support heroes, have uh, automatic healing that kicks in after they haven't taken damage for a while. Very similar to Mercy's passive, but a little bit of a lower rate. One of the more shocking changes that we've been exploring in Overwatch 2 PvP is a change to the tank role entirely. That's applied to all of the tanks. We want to try to make them more toe-to-toe -to -toe brawlers and less characters that just stand back and protect other people. So for example, for Reinhardt, we've given him two charges of fire strikes, so we can throw fire strikes a lot more aggressively and more often. Also his charge, he's able to cancel it now, and you can steer it more aggressively, so you can, you know, not quite turn a corner, but you can definitely more accurately pin targets. And because you can cancel it, it allows you to use it much more aggressively and you know, really go after those key targets without feeling like you're going to sacrifice, you know, all of your positioning, everything to get there. He's almost more terrifying now with us to be able to unleash his full arsenal more often than kind of just being the guy with a shield. The changes to Reinhardt that we're trying, and they might not shift, that's just the reality, but the changes that we're trying right now are to try to embrace more of that instinct that players have when they want to play a big, burly character that looks aggressive and feels like it should be aggressive. Shortly after BlizzCon, we, we spun up this group, our combat feel group, um, to really just work on what happens when a player holds the trigger. We're putting a ton of effort into looking at all of our characters um, and trying to give them even a more visceral weapon feel. From sound to VFX to animation to the design of these units, all new sounds for, for a lot of our weapons in the game and a whole new sound system that's driving it. And we didn't just level up a unit, we leveled up the rest of the game. When we first started working on Overwatch, you know, we spent quite a bit of time working on gunfire sounds and just, just general combat feel to make it feel really awesome. Uh, we're revisiting pretty much everything, nothing's off the table, so we're looking at even kind of small things such as quick melee attacks that every hero has. So they have kind of new audio pass and uh, a new kind of feel and visual effect when you hit things. One of the bigger efforts we're undertaking for Overwatch 2 is what we're calling our Weapon 2.0 Sound Pass. What this is is a big overhaul to the weapon systems in the game. That means the way the gun feels in your hands, you could feel the ammo running out as you're getting lower on the clip. We've really tried to amplify those sounds to better encapsulate the gameplay and the gunplay that comes with Overwatch 2. Another key for the weapons was getting them to feel like they're in the environment. This meant working with Convolution Reverb. It's a new system that we've implemented into Overwatch. It's a way that we can capture the acoustics of an environment and transport it onto the sounds that we're using. So we went and captured tails of guns in different environments through our weapon shoots. And then we've cut them and applied it so that we can support a lot more environments. Now we're sporting outdoor, urban outdoor, warehouse tails, tight tunnels, small rooms, and it gives a lot more presence to the weapons and the way that they react in the world. The shooter genre has evolved a lot since Overwatch 1 came out. On top of that, I think we really want to push the visceral nature of how we do combat. So we focused a lot, not just on the wonderful sound effects, but also with 
how the, the gun moves as you shoot. You know, so you can really feel every single shot leaving the chamber. And there's a lot of subtle little tweaks we have to do on the gameplay engineering side to make that feel really visceral. Everything from making sure that the camera shakes are crisp, making sure that if you get shot, you know exactly these tight indicators show up on the outside of your reticle. All these things play into making the game feel not just tight and responsive, but also modern and up-to-date. Take 76, for example. What we wanted to do in Overwatch 2 with his weapon was make it really feel incredibly powerful. And that happens with a bunch of different elements that mix together. But it really feels like the gun is almost just outside of your control. A lot of that comes down to this camera shake technology, where every, every time you fire the weapon, you want to feel like it's running through your entire body. And the camera shake gives that extra bite to every single shot out of the chamber. It makes him feel really great. You guys got a sneak peek of Sojourn from Last BlizzCon. She's been uh, under development for quite a while, and she's actually quickly at this point become a lot of people's favorites in-house. In when we look back at Overwatch when it was originally created, um, there was a lot of heroes that were made from a gameplay standpoint kind of surrounding a weapon type. For example, Farah was based on a rocket launcher hero. Widowmaker is clearly like kind of the sniper. We thought there was a weapon that was kind of missing that would be a lot of fun to play with, and that's a railgun. It's so much fun in the playtest to have this really powerful shot that can you know, rip through enemies if you really are accurate with it. And she's, she's all about that aim skill. So if you, if you got that aim skill, you'll love her. We're still exploring new game modes, and we're also reevaluating older game modes that people are more critical of. You know, we're of the mindset, maybe, maybe 2CP doesn't exist in Overwatch 2, and maybe there's a new cool game mode that replaces it. We really want Overwatch 2 to feel like the next evolution, a true sequel to the first game, not an add-on. It's not a small part. It's not an extension of the original game. This is an evolution and a replacement to the original game. And I think it's exciting. Hero missions are probably one of the things that's the hardest to wrap your head around if you've never played one of them. The goal around hero missions is for these to be this co-op PvE experience. I personally only play competitive mode. Like, I'm all about that competition. And I have friends that they don't want to do that at all. So I'm really looking forward to a game that I can play hours and hours with, with my friends who aren't in competitive. And it's also something that I'm interested in. Hero missions are the content that people are playing as they are leveling up their heroes. And so for a system like this to really sing, you need a lot of missions. We don't want players to feel like they're just in this grind to get to the top. And there's a lot of really, really good back-end technology that we're exploring so that the heroes are constantly bringing their personality and some light story to these hero missions as well. The goal is to make as many as possible, hundreds of hero missions. We've explored a lot of different ways of getting to that much content. So we'll have like different sets of enemy units that people will be fighting against. And there's different hero mission types at the same time, hero missions can take place in all of the multiplayer maps that we've done. And we're also adding new spaces onto some of these maps. It's a huge challenge for the art team. We take maps that a lot of people love and recognize, and we have to add a lot more art and level design to it. In this one hero mission play test, we came up to an area in King's Row that usually has a gate on it. Suddenly that gate opened and I saw a new area of King's Row that I had never seen before. You may be playing a payload game type and the payload may decide to take this new route instead of going the usual route. That was really, really cool. It was like this eye-opening special moment. Lan, our lead tech artist on the environment side, very early on her own free time, made a prototype of a sandstorm on the Temple of Anubis map. And at the time, we didn't know what we wanted to do with that, but it looked awesome. We looked at it and went, oh my god, we absolutely have to do this. So we put some new technology in place that allows us to do this dynamically. You start the mission off, clear day, midway through the mission, suddenly this sandstorm or heavy weather would show up. It made the world just feel so much more alive. There's a sunset, daytime, nighttime, 
but depending on where you are in the world, these look different. California or Hollywood would have what we call a California sun. In Nubani, there's a great African sun that happens there. You start to get a sense of space and mood. This is what really brings the levels to life. For me, the dynamic world's exciting. Just seeing these dramatic landscapes, the wind and the atmosphere blowing by. It's a much more cinematic experience for the player. Before you start a mission, you look at a map. It's nighttime in Necropolis, or there's a sandstorm in Necropolis. Players can make some comp choices based on knowing this information. Characters like Hanzo or Widowmaker start to be a little more valuable because they have abilities that allow them to see through the sand more clearly. Are we going to talk about any of the types of objectives in hero missions? Yeah, let's let's talk about the objectives. Players are being asked to do different things from one hero mission to the next so that they all feel really fresh to the player. For example, we have Gather and Return, where you're trying to go and grab these different canisters to kind of safeguard them so they don't go off and affect the population in a negative way. It creates this really cool tension in the world where, on the one hand, you're trying to split up and go grab all these canisters to be as efficient as possible. But at the same time, now you're having these sort of special enemy unit spawn that are really difficult, and if you kind of get caught by yourself, it turns into a pretty bad situation really quickly, and it feels extremely cooperative and like a very different way to interact with the Overwatch universe. We're experimenting with all sorts of ideas, and just internally we have names like Wall of Death, Scavenger Hunt, and Kill Quest, and all these new mechanics and enemies for people to experience. Players will be able to jump in night after night play different hero missions, and then work through the progression system, leveling up their heroes. At BlizzCon in 2019, we started to talk about progression, and we showed the very early version of our talent system, which I think was really cool. We had that one talent where like May became the rolling snowball, which was a big hit. We've really blown that system out. I'm real excited about talents. You can play the same hero in so many different ways. Now with the skill tree, you can have fun every night doing different things and kind of experimenting. Yeah, the talent system is like really deep and rich, and every single hero has different trees. You might open up 76's tree, and as you're leveling and picking new talents, you're starting to feel your hero change. We've had some pretty hilarious versions of the healing one where his biotic field travels with him. It also repulses enemies. We called it the snowplow build, where 76 is like running through spaces, pushing enemies away from them. <laughs> Designing these is super fun because it's like we get to break all the rules that we've sort of established for ourselves and uh, we get to really take the gloves off and do crazy things like Junkrat can do wield grenade launchers and we've had Mercy be able to area effect res the whole team at once at super long range through walls. It's been a ton of fun, kind of like mad scientists making all this stuff. You're all used to using these kind of kinetic weapons like Soldier 76's rifle or fire attack like what Reinhardt's Flame Strike does. As soon as you start to mutate these things with talents, all of a sudden maybe you're doing freeze damage or electrical damage, but it gives the animators a bunch of crazy opportunities. You know, the animations are going to change to show them freezing and shattering. And if you, you know, shock someone with a lightning attack, they can shake in place and stun, maybe chain to other enemies. All sorts of stuff to make you feel like you're controlling the battlefield in novel ways. As a huge RPG nerd myself, the first time I opened up the talent tree system, it was like, oh my gosh, this is this is speaking my love language. Like, I just want to plan and I want to see like, where do I want to invest and how am I going to play this character? Yes, it's so great. And you like, <laughs> you start at the bottom of the tree. Like, yes, oh my, exactly. like Tracer gets to do what? Yeah. And then you start working and kind of planning how you're going to get down there. It's like, oh, yeah. it's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> When we look back at BlizzCon 2019 and we talk about some of the criticisms that we had, one of them as a development team that we felt was that the combat was just not engaging enough. So the fact that our combat wasn't highly engaging to us as players meant that we had a problem with the enemy units and that they just weren't feeling interesting enough. Just because we show something to the public, it doesn't mean that that is what it's going to be. If we make discoveries where things aren't working how we want, they're not reading how we want, they're not fun enough, we're totally down to reinvestigate, reiterate, and just really find ways to level kind of all aspects of 
things until they feel good. I would say a major focus of all of 2020 was to make the null sector enemy units more engaging. And some of this was adding new units and evolving other units that we had. Interesting combat for us is varied combat for us. So sometimes we're gonna ask you to protect something in Overwatch 2. Sometimes we're just gonna ask you to get someplace. Sometimes we might ask you to escort something across a map while it's being attacked. And so it's a different type of spawning and it's a different type of units that are that are in there and it's a simpler objective. There's a lot of units Aaron is talking about. Lots of different units, lots of different types. They serve different purposes. You do different things to them. It's really gonna help a lot of us find the fun and make sure that Overwatch 2 is a blast. One of those sets of, of enemies is, is what we internally call objective units. And they're typically units that don't even attack players. The simplest version would be something like the Breacher. It's two legs with this huge bomb on its back. It was built to do one thing, slowly and methodically march towards its objective. And then it transforms and the bomb opens up like a flower. It starts spinning and charging up and you hear this awesome sound and you know you have a little bit of time before it's gonna explode and you have to take it out. We have units like the slicers, which you guys have seen before, they, they're little, we call them the chickens, <laughs> they're little chickens sometimes, they run, they run really fast. You know, we have a guy we're experimenting with right now who flies and drops these bombs that create these kind of ever-expanding smoke fields that you have to escape from because they're super deadly. Um, so you really get to use your mobility options to kind of escape that. There's things like the polar. You could be moving through these darker alleys, and as soon as you hear that polar spawn, it suddenly becomes like, really spooky and kind of scary. This very tall, elegant looking character that's blindfolded, three orbs that circle around her as her eyes. And we, we basically spun those orbs around her head as a big tell, launched them at the player, and then it activated this tractor beam and it's bringing you in and bringing you in. And then you get this awesome like anticipation of the hair opening up so you know what's about to happen. One thing we've just recently been experimenting with is this idea of elite units. We didn't want the elite units to feel like they're just, oh, this guy's got double health and double damage. We want to make sure the elite units feel like they have different behaviors and have different attacks. So for example, an, an Omnic Grunt, normally he just kind of, he fires his gun, he dies pretty simply. If you fight elite Grunts, his weapon fires in a burst fire pattern. It's very deadly if you're close. And if you manage to take him out, they don't just die right away. They instead can crawl on the ground towards you and you, 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 know, you try to back away because um, you know, if they get to you, they can explode. Artillery at BlizzCon. We're all just staring at this and we're like, what is? what are we gonna do to level this up? One of the things we really felt wasn't coming through was the damage states. We intend for players to shoot these guns off, but currently it's not reading as something that can happen in the game easily. We change the design, we change the animation, and we go back and forth and just continually iterate. We decided, hey, you know what? We're gonna just delete half of these damage states, so now it's super readable. From an animation standpoint, we decided on the spinning barrel version. It just did this really nice kickback. The tip of the barrel opens up when it's about to fire and shifts into place and boom! It's really amazing to be fighting an artillery unit and you can see the guns on the side and as you're shooting the guns, they're actually visibly taking damage and then you can blow them off and it reacts and kind of stumbles to the side and really makes you feel like you're there and it's super fun. In a lot of the stuff we've showed so far, you're fighting Null Sector. These are evil killing machines intent on marching you down. The way you're gonna stop them is by shooting them. And we wanna make sure that feels responsive and visceral. Really making sure that when they take a hit, it feels like their whole body has been punched, almost like hit by a truck. That's what really sells this fantasy that you're playing these superheroes. One of the cool pieces of technology that we created was what we call chain hit reactions. Oftentimes you'll find Null Sector bunched up marching maybe a half a dozen units abreast. You expect if you shoot one, they're gonna knock them to their buddies. So we make that happen. Turns out it's really fun too. One of the things that we showed last year at BlizzCon was the new looks for our heroes. The theory kind of going in was like, you wanna preserve the essence of your hero, but also kind of show that that hero has evolved and kind of changed and moved forward. So we have a lot more new looks. So I'm excited to see how players and fans react to all of the ones that we've done so far. Maybe we'll share some of those new looks 
uh, yeah. today, which would be cool. We're going to reveal uh, McCree's new look for Overwatch 2 as well as Farah, and we're really excited to show off some of our first villains uh, with Reaper and Widowmaker. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about technical wear, kind of like technical clothing. What that really is, is using you know, very techy fabrics, as well as you know, having very intricate but functional straps designed in a way that it's very aesthetically pleasing. With McCree, we took a couple of different approaches. He's got this classic cowboy look that it's really hard to mess with because if you try to make him too sophisticated or too techy, it might not feel right for the character. But as a concept artist, you always want to change things around and try different shapes and, and silhouettes. So we did identify his red serape as the main thing for McCree. We also tried a couple different things with McCree's cowboy hat. We didn't really want to mess with that too much because that's a very iconic part of him. So that's another piece that we that we kept. We tried some retro cowboy looks that mixed in some tech here and there. Um, some that were a little bit more techy than others, some that were a little bit more classic cowboy. We gave him a little bit of a longer beard and it really gives him a nice kind of like a, a more aged look. What's different about Farah than some of our other heroes is Farah's completely covered in armor. We didn't want to change her silhouette too much. Um, it was more about experimenting on different colors. So it felt really appropriate for her to be the one to harken back to those original Overwatch colors of white and blue. One of the things that we wanted to update on Farah was her visor. Instead of being completely opaque and reflective, we tried a little bit more of a transparent approach and being able to see through it a little bit now allows us to see some more of her, some more of her emotions. Reaper was actually the ones I was very excited to work on because I could see a lot of potential in how we can integrate his cloak and his cowl and his armor and how we can make all those shapes really sing within that classic, you know, Reaper silhouette. We tried a couple takes with the first pass, like completely silver arms, more layers to his jacket. Reaper's mask is obviously pretty sacred to us, but the thing you'll notice immediately is that it's now completely silver. Instead of the bone white, he's got the, this like almost like deadly edgy silver that just gives him that classic Reaper look. With Widowmaker, we started with the IDA stage, exploring a breadth of ideas. We tried things like a more insectoid approach, Treasure Hunter. One of them made her feel like a classic Bond villain. So we kind of steered it back towards one of the more cyberpunk looking ones, almost like a futuristic femme fatale, which is basically what Widowmaker is, but she even feels more upgraded. So I'm super glad that we went down this route. We played with different hairstyles too. Widowmaker has the really long ponytail that's a really key part of her look. And we really liked the hairstyle on one of the designs that was more of a parade. And it was really interesting look that also preserves Widowmaker's original silhouette with that long ponytail. We've been working a lot with um, our domino engine and making our cloth look better. Now that we have this cloth tech, we're gonna be able to make some really cool, unique silhouettes that will help them stand out from other heroes. We put a lot of time and effort into our face rig. And what I mean by that is we're gonna be able to get really close to these characters and it's gonna feel really cool. It is absolutely worth the time and the effort to invest in the technology. And that way we can make these characters do more things that we haven't really been able to do before. It's been super exciting working on the new looks for Overwatch 2. And it's just been so inspiring to watch the team try things that we've never tried before. And I just can't wait to show up more in the future. Overwatch 2 is probably the largest opportunity we've had since the inception of the franchise to really expand what Overwatch even means to our players. In Zero Hour, we saw that some of the heroes got back together, but we're also seeing that there seems to be a second huge Omnic uprising. We're gonna learn who's behind that uprising, why that's happening, how globally spread is it? The story and franchise development group, they were really the torchbearers of what the big story is that we were gonna tell for this game. We have a lot of interaction with them. They're working on in-game cinematic intros and outros for every one of our story missions. It's been really great to see this collaboration grow and develop. The story is just a little more integrated into our missions than it ever really has been before. All the available heroes get dialogue for a given mission. We have NPCs. We have multiple hero choices. We have all sorts of events that are happening that are driving players to interact with each other or parts of the environment or other characters. The world of Overwatch is this bright, shiny future. 
So how do you take that bright, shiny future and create conflict in it? How dark can the world of Overwatch go? The different challenges that these characters are going to have to overcome in Overwatch 2 are things that they haven't ever dealt with before or dealt with on this scale. So what we had to do was literally strip it down to those bare bones of where are these characters in their lives? Overwatch has been disbanded, and now there's a situation where the world's in trouble again, and the world needs the heroes again, but they're not allowed to be doing what they were supposed to be doing. We started to book these off-site locations so we could brainstorm over and over different versions of what the Overwatch 2 story campaign could be. And we basically had these whiteboards that we were carting around everywhere. The room was filled with whiteboards and we would just write every day story beats with the characters and who was doing what and where and oh my gosh, we forgot this character. We had these giant sticky notes and each one of them would be a mission with a bunch of notes on it. You know, somebody say, well, what if we moved Rio to the end and they'd physically grab it off the wall and stick it on the end. And we did this for a while, you know, until we all felt that it was pretty close to what we wanted. Then we could send it to our writer's rooms. The writer's rooms then had a much clearer direction of where we wanted this process to go. Ultimately, we come up with something that we think is right for the game. And then we pitch it back to the game team and they point out everything that uh, we missed. And that allows us to actually back up and go and make it right and make it better. Because the scale of this story is so huge, it takes place over the whole world, basically. It just requires a constant iteration, constant refinement to make the story as best as we can make it. From writing, we go to storyboards. The storyboards get crafted with the edit. From there, it'll go to a previs department where they'll start to flesh it out in 3D. Once we've kind of figured out our camera work and our cinematography, that'll then go to the animation department. And then we end up going right into the game engine. One of our challenges was to figure out how to integrate this story and this narrative with the gameplay. So if the intro cinematic ends with this huge battle, this huge war, when you get into the game, it has to mesh and feel the exact same way and blend together. We really are also trying to get the music to be equally as consistent from in-game cinematics straight through to the mission. Adam Burgess, our lead composer, has been working with the IGC team, with the game team, developing themes for all of the heroes, all of the locations. As the cinematic director, whatever we're crafting should never override the gameplay. We want to make sure that the player's experience going from the cinematic to the gameplay is seamless and it feels like a completely immersive experience the engineers, we have to find a way to actually make that come to fruition. The Choreo tool is a tool that allows people to coordinate different events to happen at the same time. Like in Rio, if you've played our demo, one of the buildings explodes. And so that kind of event needs to happen as you're running by and you need to have it timed because if it blows up too early, then you don't see it. It allows story moments in missions that interact with the environment, that interact with our characters. The new tech, the new abilities that we have now are allowing us to push our storytelling farther than we could have previously. What's also really powerful about Choreo is that, you know, if somebody has an idea, they can mock things up really quickly. We got to show the Widowmaker making this awesome introduction. Casey was able to quickly put a really rough prototype in Choreo. And Philip would come in and on the fly, he's making quick changes. They play tested something that would normally take weeks. It was done in like a matter of days. Each story mission has its own custom map built for it. And these maps are absolutely gigantic. India is one of our biggest maps. And it's a fun map because it has a few story beats that we've taken from recent comics and, and characters in the game. We've written a history for each city so that the cities feel lived in. And I think that informs the artists so that they know like what it is that the city has been through. Gothenburg was our chance to show Torbjorn's workshop. We created a space that kind of fits his height. So there's you know step ladders and scalable tables. We designed the space as if we were Torbjorn. Molten steel is pouring out of walls. It's pretty epic when you walk into it. Toronto is under siege by Null Sector when the players arrive here. There's a dynamic snowstorm. So as you make your way through the level, the snow is slowly building up. Suddenly by the end, the characters are caught in this gigantic snowstorm and they must fight their way through. In Overwatch 2, we want to give you choice to be able to play this character or that character. So we're designing a lot of systems around how their relationships develop over the course of the story missions in the campaign. 
we have a cast of many characters all on screen, all at the same time. And it's fantastic to actually see them all interacting and working together in ways that we've never actually seen. We've always thought about it and hoped for it, but now it's actually happening. It actually requires us to have a whole new branching dialogue system. If you happen to have Genji and Mercy in the second mission of the game, you might get different dialogue that's about their relationship. Our voice actors bring the characters to life in ways that everybody has fallen in love with, from inside Blizzard to the fans. It's just to hear this collection of actors all together, all interacting, has been a real treat. <laughs> I wish people could see how many people are involved when it comes to something like telling the story of Overwatch. It doesn't just come from a singular person, it comes from a group, and it's a really talented, fun group that all works together. We've been developing what we hope is one of the best stories ever. And, uh, there's some key story moments that I'm really excited about, and I really can't wait to see how people react to it. We've been talking about the game, about the, this universe. I know you all love it so much. Right now, we can sit down and have a night of Overwatch 2 and have it be a really fun experience. And I think we need some more time till we can say it's perfectly polished in the way that we want it. We've made such incredible strides since we first announced this and showed it to the community at BlizzCon in 2019. The thing that I'm most excited about is that moment when we hand the game over to the players. We want to create something that really moves people, really touches people. That's why we do it. We create the game because we want it to become part of your life and for you to experience it. For Overwatch 2, we're upping the bar. It's kind of five games in one. It's a huge undertaking. The new tech and the new aesthetics for the new looks bring you closer to the characters that you love, and we're just getting started. The fidelity of the gameplay experience is much richer. We are making cinematics that push the boundary of what we can do to tell stories. We want this dynamic world. We want things to feel alive. I'm really looking forward to being able to expand the world of Overwatch for our players. We're really trying to tell this epic story in order to make a game great, it takes time, energy, collaboration. <laughs> we have just an incredibly professional team of designers and artists and engineers. We just love bringing this world to you guys. So many cool characters. It's just a blast working on it. Our goal is for Overwatch 2 to be the worthy successor to the first game, to be the next evolution and to be a true sequel. We have big plans, so thank you for sticking with us. We're gonna cross the finish line, and I know it's gonna be awesome. I hope people just end up loving playing it over and over. That's what we want to try and capture. I'm jumping in, I'm playing. Let's go <laughs> be heroes.